And hello folks, happy Halloween. My name is Anthony Kerrigan and tonight on the Ghost Era channel we're going to be talking to blogger, writer and paranormal investigator Emma L. Hollerhan. Hi. How are you doing, Emma? I'm well, thank you. How, how are you doing? Uh, yes, so folks, uh, we're going to be talking topics tonight will include uncanny community, also White Horse of Uffington, I hope I said it right in Oxfordshire, um, England. And finally, St. Michael's. Oh, no, sorry. The Whispering Mummies of St. Michael's. I hope I pronounced it right. If you're watching, please let us know if we uh, said it right. Anyway, um, there's a number of ways you can ask uh, questions to Emma tonight. You can put them on the stream. You can also go to our website, www.gosteria.net. Go to the contact page, fill in the blanks. If you have a private message, just put in brackets private message if you're affiliated with any paranormal team or tourist attraction feel free to name the group or the organization put it in brackets on this feed and we will give a shout out to you nobody much does it but look for the publicity anyway uh we come in live here through facebook and also our website www.ghostera.net by playing by pressing the red button the ghost air channel will bring you onto the live feed there you'll be able to catch past shows and see what's coming up on the future from that page we also have a competition folks to, tonight where two of you have the opportunity to enter our halloween mega draw the penultimate chance to do it you can only do that uh, by commenting on the show uh, that will be for the Halloween extravaganza on the 30th of October. Will the draws, uh, two draws, a collection of two collection prizes, will be given away. Um, so, without further ado, how are you doing, Emma? Hi, I'm well, thank you. Delighted to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on board, there, Emma. And uh, we've got the first subject is going to be about uncanny. So, what is uncanny, and who is Danny Robbins? Um, so Uncanny, um, it's a popular paranormal podcast. Um, it started a couple of years back, um, I think probably during um, the pandemic. I think it was, um, we started recording then. Um, also, it was on broadcast on the radio, I think BBC. Um, so you might not have got it out in, out in Ireland. Um, that's kind of uh, moved on to being uh, broadcast on TV. Um, also, they've done some live shows. And there's been a couple. There's been an uncanny con, another one of those coming up in December as well. Um, okay. So yeah, it's um, become quite popular, and it's kind of based on uh, real life um, supernatural experiences of people. Um, viewers write in with their different experiences, um, and those are featured on the podcast. Uh, could be ghosts and hauntings, could be cryptids, all, all kinds of things really. Um, and each episode. Um, Danny will delve into kind of the case. Um, listeners will also write in with their theories on it. He'll talk to experts um, in the field, you know, parapsychologists, um, mm -hmm. skeptics, believers, that kind of thing, um, to kind of um, unpick or, or, or look at the experiences. Yeah. And he comes at it from a very kind of neutral stance. Right. Um, so you're not kind of told what to believe. You're not told, to, you know, you don't have to debunk it. You don't have mm -hmm. to believe in it. It's kind of, yeah, left quite open for you. Um, yeah. And he's the, Danny's the host um, and he's done a few kind of paranormal projects. I think, I think he's a comedian and writer and. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask you about it. He's got a kind yeah. of theatrical kind of, I think he's worked on. Yeah. Stories. Yeah. I think so. Um, I first uh, kind of started listening to him when he did the Battersea Poltergeist. Mm. um and that was one of the things i think i started uh, listening to um that was a bbc um radio thing as well and also you know you could listen to it as a podcast um mm. i listened to that and that's a, a dramatization of a, of a kind of real life uh, poltergeist um um thing in, in in london um and i was listening to that in the pandemic and it, kind of scared scared the socks off me because i used to listen yeah. to it on my own it was my <laughs> secret thing i used to listen to um but yeah then i got into uncanny um so he's done that one he's also done one called um the witch farm and yes. um yeah he's done a stage show um 
222 a ghost story which is um taught around britain i think it's been to ireland as well so that's mm -hmm. um pretty good so yeah he's kind of um he's kind of paranormal storytelling has kind of helped spark a, a new interest for some people in the paranormal yeah uh, i've got to talk a bit more about it there shortly just give a few shout outs hi jonathan how you doing from county for manor hope you're Ooh. keeping well and um, Bridget, how you doing, Bridget, in County Wexford there? Seekers of the Afterlife, how you doing? Bridget, I hope you're keeping well. Um, yeah, so it's, like Danny there, it's, it's so the cases, they have several cases, but what has been the most talked about? What, as you said, I know they did the yeah. uh, poltergeist, but is there any other mm. cases or known that? Oh, there's, uh, there's there's quite a few. I mean, it's quite difficult to, to choose. Um... The most talked about or the most popular i mean i, I have my personal favorites um mm -hmm. and i asked a few pals who are in the uncanny community as well like you know what ones they think are the most striking um i mean the top one is going to be um one called the the evil in room 611 and okay. it was what it was actually the first um of the podcast episodes and this was set in northern ireland um at university there and a chap called ken um, not okay. his real name, who's apparently a very influential geneticist, hence doesn't want people to know that he's kind of experienced these ghosts and you know things. Mm. Um, but that almost adds to it because, you know, it's someone who's very scientific, um, yes. skeptical, has had this experience. And, yeah, when he was at university, he stayed in this room, room 611, and had very, quite a terrifying poltergeist experience in there over, um, you know, his whole period of staying in that room, quite, quite frightening. Mm. Um, and he came was kind of quite a bit of a celebrity in the um, uncanny community as well, because he was on Twitter and, you know, he'd engage quite a lot. And um, the catchphrase, bloody hell, Ken, came came from that as well, where Danny kind of was shocked at something <laughs> that happened to, to Ken. So you can get the T-shirt now with bloody hell, Ken on it. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the most popular, the most talked about. Um, as he, as he said there, yeah. the, like the people behind, like, you know, the, the witnesses, the people that have encountered these things, you do kind of, they've got no kind of gain from doing all this by, to, by, uh, by explaining their experiences there. They're all in well-to-do jobs yeah. or, but not in a well-to-do job, but they have good careers or settled and all that. Yeah. And they're coming back with their experiences there. Exactly. Uh, and they might not necessarily you know they, they want to get answers for what happened they may not necessarily 100 percent think oh this was definitely a ghost or haunting or, or, or whatever but they want answers for for what's happened to them what have they experienced and that's kind of you know part of the show they kind of try to figure out it's, it's not disbelieving the experience it's kind of looking at you know what that experience could have been maybe it was ghosts maybe it was something else so mm -hmm. yeah i think that's part of the appeal as well uh, and, uh, Ashley, Ashley, sorry, uh, Ashley says hi all <laughs> from my holidays in Spain. So hi, Ashley. Talk. Um, so carry on, sorry there, Emma. Um, yeah, I think um, there's there's a few other cases that are really interesting as well, um, quite popular ones. Um, my personal favourite is the return of Elizabeth Dacre. Um, this was in the first um, series as well. It was case 13, I think. Um, and this is um, a family that moved into um, a, a house in Rottingdean, in, um, not too far from Brighton in, in England. Mm. And this was quite an old building and converted from a, what, what used to be a famous hotel. Oh. I think it was the hotel that uh, the game Cluedo, the house in that was... was um, Thanks, kind of the inspiration for yeah okay. so you get tourists go there who are looking at it because they want to see the cluedo house i uh -huh. did actually go and visit it because i was like oh it's, it's the house <laughs> like <laughs> creepily taking pictures um but yeah that that's one of my favorite ones um i think cause it's got a bit of a slight time slip element to it it's mm. um basically they they um experience um the old owner the, the kind of haunting from the old owner a lady called elizabeth dacre prominent mm. lady in the area apparently um but at one point they walk into a room and basically they've had a time slip because they're back in the old hotel. Right. And I, I, I do like a time slip. So um, that's one of my favourites. And I think that's one that's talked about. But, yeah, there's a few others. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. We're, we're going to touch on a bit more of it. Uh, mm. I'm just going to a few more shout outs. Uh, Bridget's just tagging everyone else. Maybe she's just put followers of whole of Ireland and England and worldwide, that would be great, <laughs> that, Bridget. Uh, Liz, Liz Barkley. Hi, Liz, how are you doing? Hi, Liz. Are you keeping well? 
Uh, Joanne says, hi all, how's the evening? Everyone's good there so far. Hopefully, if you're out tonight there, folks, or next few days, be careful if mm -hmm. you're out in Ireland and Britain. There's a storm coming up. Uh, Brian, how are you doing, Brian? I think I remember your face from the convention um, a couple of weeks ago in Wickham. How are you doing, Brian? Hope you're keeping well. Manny says hi there. How are you doing, Manny? Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so we talked about a few of the cases then. Now we're looking at the people behind it now, now the mm -hmm. kind of um, professionals that kind of give their oh, opinion yeah. on the show there. So um, who are these experts, maybe on the radio shows, television and theatre? Um, they kind of, there's a mix of them usually. Um, so you get different ones, um, kind of guest experts. So you can get all kinds of people. But there's there's kind of a core um, few people. Um, one of them, um, Evelyn Hollow. Um, she's a parapsychologist and writer. Um, she's often... Um, She's kind of appeared in quite a few TV programs, radio shows, that kind of thing, podcasts. Um, and she gives um, kind of a paranormal perspective. She's more, she's kind of, a, I think she's a, kind of a believer, but she comes out with lots of sceptical arguments as well, being a, you know, a parapsychologist. Mm. But she kind of, she's a bit of a mix, I, I think, with her, how she talks about things. Yeah, she's um, like probably, I suppose you could say that yeah. about... She, she, she tries yeah. to, she's about like 100% nice by psychologist. Mm. Well, she's a psychologist, but she's 66%. Yeah. Believe it, I thought she could say something like that. I think it's because um, she's she's pagan in belief. Mm. So she leans towards um, believing that there, there could be spirits and things like this. But then she's got the scientific aspect. So she's, yeah, she's kind of, yeah, a bit of a 50-50 uh, mix. Um, I think she, she also brings a bit of glamour to the show as well. She's a... Um, very uh gothic noir so um she's uh mm. brings brings that aspect too um you've got kieran o'keefe um so he's he's a, a a psychologist who specializes in parapsychology and forensic psychology um some people might have seen him a long time back in um most haunted um so mm. he's been on a few things like that and he he really adds to the skeptical side of the discussion but um yeah he he's also someone who want, wants to believe but yeah he stays quite well firmly in the scientific camp there um mm -hmm. so he's yeah sometimes he comes across as a, a bit of a cynic but i think he is quite open actually yeah. um then you've got deborah hyde um she's also a skeptic so there's a lot of skeptics they're not all on the same program there's usually you know a believer mm -hmm. and a skeptic and maybe you know someone a, a guest expert um but yeah, you get Deborah Hyde comes on there and she she's known for her work in folklore and supernatural beliefs. Um, another lady who brings a bit, a bit of glamour to the show as well. She's a very um, yeah. nice and knowledgeable lady. Um, I think another core cool member is Chris French, another um, psychologist. Um, and yeah, once again, um, more of a sceptic side and looking at the science of it. And yeah, you get guest people quite often um, in the believer camp as well. You get guest experts. Um, for example, the Reverend Peter Laws has been on there um, a few times. I think he was in one of the first ones, um, and he's more of um, the, belie the believer camp. He uh, he writes for 14 times and does his own uh, YouTube. Um, I think Into the Fog it used to be called Frightful. Um, mm. So he's been on there a few times as well, and yeah, other other people that they bring in on different subjects. I'm just going to go to people's statements soon there, but there's one question that probably would be interesting. I don't know. I forgot to mention it a couple of weeks ago to Kieran there. But, um, would there be an, an aspect where you could put somebody like Team Psy into it, into the fold? Maybe something a bit different, you know, that it's not to do with spirits. It's not to do with displacing phenomena like skeptics, but actually to do with the 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 the, the yeah. mind like you know i don't know if it's an aspect that it can come into a couple of episodes there you know yeah yeah um i mean you've got the the kind of they they focus on the two camps the team believer mm. and team skeptic but i always feel there should be a team on the fence as well yeah you know you think there should be other flavors like you're kind of saying there um and i'll be on team on the fence and ready to run away yeah <laughs> <laughs> one leg over the fence <laughs> You know, so, with your eye on the car <laughs> yeah, I, yeah team eye on the car <laughs> uh, yeah so i got, just got to a few more shout outs of people's uh what people have said there um uh, ed says hi everyone uh ashen's saying hi there's that uh liz barfley says chris fench a skeptic uh my favorite skeptic don't tell deborah and kieran <laughs> oh yeah 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 Ooh, Ooh. That's tricky, yeah <laughs> 
Uh, Liz is saying, hi, Ash, uh, how's your holiday going? I oh, won't we'll talk about holidays, another round of... Yeah. There's a few um, uncanny community peoples in there. <laughs> that was great to see you yeah. all there, folks, there. But I'm going to ask some interesting questions about that very soon now. Uh, very nice, man. Uh, <laughs> it's a head talk. And that's it, isn't it, talk? Yeah. So, um, as you went, <laughs> an investigation more interesting when you have a sceptic around, it gets mm. uh, debates going. Yes, you need that in investigation. Good point there, Joanne. Um, uh, I think uh, no, talking about Spanish food. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, this is uh, your legend, Ashley. Anyway, okay, so going back <laughs> to that, uh, would you be a team skeptic or believer yourself? Um, for me, yeah, I'm te team on on the fence. I'd say mm. I would like to believe, um, and I'm interested. I love all I love all of the stuff, uh, and I, I I love to listen to the different ideas and. Um, I love the folklore of things and ghost lore and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but for me, I, I've not seen any any evidence as such that would prove to me that there is something. Um, mm. But that just keeps me interested. I, you know, I, you know, that keeps my interest in it because I want I want to know. You know, I want to believe. <laughs> Maybe uh, <laughs> go a bit um, X Files there. And what is the uh, uncanny community? What is it? Do you, is it like a meeting spot? Is it like a secret coven? Like you know, or you meet up with? <laughs> Could be, could be all of those things <laughs> <laughs> um no it's um i no, i came into it um a bit later i think it was originally started on twitter i think kind of a hashtag uncanny community i think people mm. on there um started chatting when when the, sh the podcast was out the people they started chatting and um the hashtag was created and start people started getting in, in, more involved and there'd be discussions on the different cases and stuff um so it kind of generated from there i wasn't much on twitter um at that time i kind of only started going on twitter a bit more after i went to uncanny con and met some of these people okay and uh yeah then i started kind of getting a little bit more involved with it um and yeah it's it's kind of an online community um and they kind of talk quite regularly on there um sometimes there's little whatsapps groups facebook groups that kind of stuff um things on twitter as i say um quite a lot of discussions on there on the forums and the social media groups and also you know sometimes there's live events and there'll be uh, q's and a after it um mm. where uncanny community people will get in involved um can it get, I, I, know, I know this is a question, but what, 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 can it get kind of friendly? Can people really, I mean, can it get uh, like people, can you, would you, you get people there that would, it's their opinion and nobody else who has an opinion, it's, that's it? Um, are you always, I think with these things, you do always get some people like that, but I've found with the Uncanny community, um, I think the nature of the show mm. and how Danny presents it, mm has kind of fostered more of an amiable um way of communicating mm. people will talk about all the things but um they're not going to be shouting anyone down there's not there'll yeah. be people that will want to debunk stuff but they're not not gonna kind of be be treading on people or unpleasant and things like that so it doesn't get nasty you mm. know and how these days some things can get like that can't it mm. things can be very yeah. polarized you know generally out in the world um yes. but there's kind of still um gray areas are allowed you know, and you can mm. agree to disagree and that kind of stuff. That's not to say there aren't some people that will do that, but I've generally found that the people I've met through it have been quite open. They'll listen to your opinion. They'll they'll listen to the people's experiences and they're not going to mm. shout you down and say, oh, no, that's absolute piffle or whatever, and vice, vice versa if they're believers. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, they get heated sometimes, but yeah. people always leave as friends. So I think that's quite a good good thing about it. I suppose that's the uniqueness of it there. It gives people their own opinion, all individual opinion. I suppose that's what's great with that. And I think that's what happens with, like I've seen the telephone, I've seen the te telephone, television shows there last year. Yeah. I know there's a new, new uh, series coming up in the start of new year, but it's the unique, he leaves it on to people's opinions at the end. And yes. They might think at the end there's a, there's, it's gone this way, but he throws a curveball in it. That yeah. gives it another yeah. thought, another thought. Is there is there any type of other uniqueness associated with the with the um, I, yeah I think it's you know as you as I kind of like mentioned how there's still the the gray areas allowed um it's not there to definitely pr prove or disprove 
the paranormal. It's there to mm. open discussions, yeah, you know, health, healthy discussions. Um, mm. But you know, there's going to be an investigative tone. There's the storytelling aspect as well. You've got the experts from both sides. Um, you know, the critical thinking is applied to it, and also there's like the the kind of quite personal nature of some of the stories some mm. of these stories you know people haven't told anyone or told very few people because they don't think they're going to be, be, be believed or they think maybe yeah. someone's going to question their mental health or you know all kinds of things like that um so the way it's treated is very um with a lot of a lot of empathy and sensitivity mm. uh, I, I like that aspect of yeah. it and i think that's one of its uniqueness Yes, it's, yeah. a, it's a, people that have come out there, and it's, after so many years, it could go straight there. It's like some of the stories as well go back a back date, go yes. back a few years. So, yeah, um, they, they, if they wanted the complete publicity, they could go out for it back then, you know. And as, as you said, there, it's I suppose it, it's it, it's great that it's great having this show because it's got so at the moment in the world of paranormal. Uh, watching programs or shows, those that people that are into the paranormal, it's gotten so it's either this or that, yeah. and it, there's no explanation for this or that. You know, it's their own opinions, and it is great to have that kind of bit of both there. You know, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so I like, I yeah, I enjoy that aspect of it, and I think it's unique in that way, and and it's very interactive as well. I mean, um with the tv show and the podcast he will sometimes go back um on old episodes in mm. you know a few uh, uh, the mm. episode he's doing because yeah. um, yeah. he's had theories or questions come in from from viewers and listeners mm. um right. and he'll do case updates and I, I think that's a good aspect as well yes it's not just yeah. swept under the cover you can actually go back and review that case like yeah actually says i love my uncanny family <laughs> that's beautiful uh, Jonathan says, who is the most uncanny ghost adventure or most haunted? And well, who's the most, uh, who is the most uncanny ghost adventure or most? I have to say, be? I've never um, watched ghost adventures, um, <laughs> so I'm not sure. I, I don't, I don't know. I think he, maybe Jonathan might be asking there, uh, uh, who's the most uncanny ghost adventure? Or, that could be to do with, I don't know. Sorry, Jonathan, if yeah. you just let us know about that again. <laughs> Uh, Joanne says I've had my mental I've had my mental health question a lot when they say I'm on a paranormal team however the person yeah. is actually interested in ask questions but says oh I wouldn't do that yeah I think that's one of the things I like about un um, Uncanny it's made people feel that they can talk about their experiences more and not be looked at quite as badly like that mm. it's removing a little bit of stigma around it you know mm you know some people would worry about being in a paranormal team because people think well that's a bit strange yeah. um so I, I think it's kind of it's opening up conversations about um this kind of stuff and yeah it's just it's, it's open it's open i think uh christy says have you had uh any paranormal experiences yet uh question to both have i had any paranormal I've, I've had a good few there, but I got too, so many to mention there. But how about yourself, Emma? Um, I've had strange experiences that could or, or may not be paranormal. Um, mm. One of them I um, had earlier this year, actually. Um, that was in a Welsh cottage. Um, I went for um, a trip in the summer to um, Penny Fan, which is mountain and wanted to climb this mountain i'm not particularly fit um, but i was like right we're gonna we're gonna do it so mm. we did um, and we stayed in a little cottage not too far from there it's kind of a quite an old terrace cottage um, so you know maybe you're primed already because you're looking at the place and you think oh <laughs> is this place haunted who knows it could be a bit of that um, but i you know i didn't particularly that wasn't particularly going through my mind um, but that night when i was um dropping off to I was, I was getting ready to go to bed um i was just laid down and my husband went to use the bathroom and i heard this really strange noise like someone crying out and i thought oh All god right. maybe he's hurt himself because the stairs were right next to like, like little um winding stairs were right next to the bathroom door and mm -hmm. i thought it's dark maybe he's come out and he's you know tumbled down the stairs or something i got up nothing he's just you know using the bathroom as normal so okay. i went back to bed and when he came back in i asked if he'd heard a 
someone you know someone cry out he hadn't heard anything I was like well did you yawn really loudly or did you do anything no nope, not him and I was so concerned I actually got him to go downstairs and look in case someone had got into the cottage hmm. not peep um so we we're trying to figure out what it could have been I wasn't like ready to sleep so I, I didn't think it would be sleep paralysis or something hypnagogic but I suppose it might have been hmm. um but I wasn't I was kind of like sat in bed kind of looking at my phone type thing or just about settling down so I don't think it was that um next day in the evening we were listening out to see is, what, what the sounds of the cottage were. You know, could you hear yeah. things settling? Yeah. Could it have been the chimney? Mm. You know, maybe like the cooling of the boiler. Mm. But we couldn't kind of pinpoint anything. And that night I had a really creepy sleep paralysis type dream. Well, I think it was okay. a dream. My husband's like, oh, maybe not. But I <laughs> dreamt. <laughs> I, I, experienced, <laughs> I experienced creepy kind of like hand with mm. long fingernails coming to like grasp at me in the bed and I woke yeah. up in a cold sweat next day I could not wait to go back to my own bed in Bristol yeah. <laughs> now for me it's maybe it's something I do get sleep paralysis but it's not my normal dream mm. I usually get that um, archetypal dark figure dream yeah um, so that was not entirely the normal one um, mm. so but it could have it could have been you know sleep paralysis maybe the sound was something hypnagogic gogic i don't know as i say mm. i wasn't actually kind of laid down ready to sleep at that time but maybe my mind was starting to meditate i don't know mm. um but or, or was it something creepy was it a ghost that's it i, yeah, I don't i don't know <laughs> you're, well you're definitely in the uncanny community there yeah. you're explaining every possibility there is all there. i know is i didn't like it um <laughs> <laughs> uh, i was going to say that um well i would could say about my paranormal experiences but i could do that for another day most of probably my paranormal experiences have been to do not outside of investigating but in my when a loved one has passed on that's when the most oh. you know, unusual stuff has happened there um, Jonathan says, yes, the t TV show Ghost Adventures. Never heard of it. Maybe yeah, I've not watched it. Maybe, 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 is it maybe. American, maybe? I think it might maybe be American. American. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I know Ghost Adventures there. Yeah. I, I might I'm not, though. I don't, I don't actually, I haven't watched it. So. <laughs> Most haunted I have, of course, but... <sighs> Ghost adventures, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, That's Jonathan, probably why I've uh, not Joanne, watched it. <laughs> Joanne says, don't mind being called crazy. You are the go daft board of Great. <laughs> uh, well, I think I'll go and uh, just one way of those anyway. Uh, <laughs> Liz says the panel community have always been polarized. Uh, mm. uh, people view us as how hanging fruit. It's really sad that people think it's okay to openly question a person's mental health when they discuss experiences, mm. investigations, or even an interest in the. So I now can't in, in the paranormal. I think there's been studies done on people and actually in mental institutes and they've found out as well in the past there that there is cases for sight and also paranormal phenomena as well there, you know. Mm -hmm. So they can't discredit what are people who have meant those that have do have mental issues have had in the past might be more open to that kind of thing. Yeah. When we, it's not just ghosts, it's more open to clairvoyance and all that uh, telepathy and all that kind of thing, precognition. Uh, yeah, Christy says, yikes, sounds in. <laughs> and Jonathan says, laugh, laugh out loud or love a lot of like ghost adventures. Anyway. <laughs> um, unexplained. Uh, hey, Adam, how are you doing? People that say oh. chasing ghosts publicly is a waste of time or mock you are usually the first to turn around and want to tell you about the yeah. experience. Yeah. True. Yeah. I suppose in the case is trying to get to the, um, like if people do paranormal investigation, it's trying to get that kind of kind of study that into it's like bringing the lab into that kind of way of way of study you know yeah. of going to places which is very difficult it's very open and there's so many things that can be classed as being you know explained or fake or for for um um so we're going to do the draw now adam you did well there you've got your name in just in there with the comments. <laughs> so i'm going to select three people here i know you're, you're going to go with a chance to go into our Halloween mega draw. So here we go. We're going to join Emma tonight in selecting a colour the ghost girl goes in front of, coloured gravestones. And here's the first one. So here we go. Oh, God, Ed's up first. Ed? That's Emma's. You're in the prize draw. 
Yeah. Ed's in the prize, Obviously, Joel. People who don't know Ed's my husband and he's in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Where I keep six, him. This is, this is random there. Uh, next person, Bridget. You're in again, Ooh. Bridget. Oh, my God. I don't know how many times you've done it now, Bridget. Now, God, that was a bit six-time lucky. Uh, we're just going to pick another one in case Ed and Bridget aren't around later on. I'm sure Ed's are going to be around. Liz. Liz. You bet Liz me. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll come to that later there. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Offington White Horse. Yes. And um, so the Offington White Horse. Can you tell us there, Emma, what is the White Horse of Offington? Um, the White Horse of Offington, it's um, it's a prehistoric hill figure um, of a horse. Lovely illustrative picture there. Um, and it's carved into the chalk hillside of the, the Berkshire Downs um, in Oxfordshire. Um, it's, and it's near the village of Uffington, hence hence the name. Um, it's thought to date back to around 3000 years to the late Bronze Age or the early Iron Age. And it surrounds um, 110 metres long. You oh. see, it's quite st a stylized horse as well. So it's kind of like it quite elongated. Okay. Um, and it's made up of um, deep, deep trenches. Um, that are kind of carved up out of the the chalk there and i think they probably filled in with, with more chalk to make it it look even more um white and impressive and it's quite distinctive and yes yeah, it's, it's a quite a striking landmark on the landscape mm. there i think i read that you can see it from about 15 miles away um okay. so yeah it's quite quite impressive and it's it's one of the oldest in 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 uh, england as well um and one of my favorite places to go for for a walk not on the horse, that would not be good, but nearby. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> My footprints all over it. <laughs> is, it true, is it true it was covered during World War Two? Yeah, because um, obviously, you know, as, as I say, you can see it from like f um, 15 miles away on, on the hillside mm. there. So you imagine it's um, quite easily recognisable um, from the sky with, you know, the Luftwaffe coming over. Um, they'd be able to use that to navigate quite easily um, to find the places they wanted to go to. So, um, yeah, it was um, they obscured it by covering it over with turf um, so that enemy aircraft couldn't see it. And, uh, yeah, once the war was over, they, they kind of... Um, restored it to how it was before and is there like apart from the offerton white horse there's some notable kind of prehistoric kind of locations close by as well isn't there yeah it's it's a really interesting area um i think that's why i like like to, to visit it because there's quite a few um prehistoric um kind of uh features around there um mm. you've got the horse i mean obviously that one's um bronze age or iron <laughs> age um I think uh, a little bit further up from it, not too far. Um, you've got Uffington Castle. Hmm. Now that one is um, that's an Iron Age hill fort, um, and that's on the same ridge. It's just above the horse, and they think that dates back to around 700 BC. Um, okay. There's not a lot known about it, so it's still being um, researched by archaeologists. Um, they think it's possibly a st strategic centre, you know, because um, it's you know if you had that fort there you'd be able to be in charge of um, entry to the west of england because it, right. it's near the ridgeway which is an ancient um path you know ancient road so it could be strategic but um as with lots of things it's also being looked at to see if it was you know had some kind of ritual or kind of religious significance as well so you've got mm. that there um not too far from there too you've got um there's, there's a small flat topped hill called dragon hill Right. Um, that's got an association with legends, um, including one around um, uh, St. George and the dragon. Right. Um, and they say um, that he slew the dragon there um, and its blood fell onto the top of the hill and it poisoned the grass on the top of the hill. And that's why there's a kind of a ball patch on that bit of hill. <laughs> so that's right. where <laughs> this legend comes from. But, okay. um, you know, I think that might come from the fact that that horse some people also interpret that as a dragon it's yes quite it does it kind, of, it kind of does yeah. look a kind of bit different as well you could interpret mm. it as, a, as a, another kind of animal yeah and then you go along the ridgeway um probably about 30 to 40 minutes walk which is a nice walk actually as tends to be where we go um you end up at wayland smithy um which is a neolithic long barrow and it's um 
one is my favourite of the long barrows in this part of the country. Um, although I do like the West Kennet as well. Um, but yeah, that's um, that's there, and that's um, that's Neolithic, so about you know approximately a thousand years old or so. Mm. Um, that has a legend associated with it as well. Um, so Wayland, um, he was he, he was captured by a Swedish king. Okay. Supposedly, this is uh, Norse Norse myths. Um, he was disfigured and f forced to work in the royal smithy. Right. Um, but he killed the king's sons and escaped. He did some other not so nice things as well. I think he drank out of their skulls or something. Not, not family, mm. not family story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he did lots of horrible things when he escaped. Um, he f he fled to the site of Wayland Smithy, and he continued on his smith works there um, until I think some of that royal family came and. And, and killed him so right. they say that his spirit um still resides in Wayland smithy and mm. um he will he's still there kind of um uh, shoeing horses and, and various things um so yeah it's quite an interesting area that place and going back to the back to the horse there because we're going to talk about the, maybe the if there's any occurrences there with paranormal yeah. phenomena there or legends there is the it, well it, apparently the archaeologists archaeologists had to go because had to go and rebuild rebuild it wasn't that true because it may have shrunk and it needed to be reshaped yeah well um not only archaeologists i think um the horse has a history of local peoples um doing a thing called scouring so oh, yeah, yeah. obviously over time the um plants and things like that vegetation would grow over the the, the um the chalk so mm. they would actually they used to have um they used to come once a year or, or, or so and they used to cut the, the grass and plants away from the um, chalk quite regularly and usually around midsummer apparently and they'd hold fairs and feasts and festivals so that right. was done throughout time but in more um, more recent times I, think, I guess perhaps that custom kind of died out um, but more recent times yeah it's um, started to shrink and lose its original shape um, and the chalk's kind of like um, slowly moving as well um you know with erosion and things so archaeologists and volunteers um have restored it by just yeah um kind of looking at historic surveys of it to kind of get the measurements right and carefully mm. rechalking um the, the horse there so that's kind of made it more authentic and returned it back to its original form and, and who, how who, who personally do you think it pays homage to like who does it as you said, is it like a deity? Is it a, a, some st story that's to do with? Is it? Is, oh, is God, it, there's... Oh, is it Rhiannon or M M I forgot right now? Forgive me. There, it's up on the um, the event um, mm. post there. Like Epona. Who, Nepona. That's it. Nepona as well. Epona. Epona. Yeah. Um, I don't really know. I mean, I think with these things, you, we can't necessarily. I definitely. I think there was a. Uh, it's a horse deity or maybe some kind of mm. horse cult i mean i have um i don't know if it would be the correct theory but i have my favorite theory um i mean you, you mentioned um you know it could be a tribal symbol mm. or a deity yeah. um you've got the horse goddess epona which was um worshipped by celtic tribes in ancient britain so mm. that's 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 a nice idea there um but of course horses um in ancient times were symbols of power and fertility and, and prestige in lots of ancient cultures and hold um, a lot of significance um so it could have been a local tribe connected you know horses to that and um or it could have been a fertility deity um so mm. some kind of horse cult right. um i quite like um <laughs> I've been reading when I wrote my um, blog post on this. I've been reading about um, the sun horse, right. um, and this is um, kind of a theme out of a few European and Asian cultures, where they associate horses with the sun and sky. In particular, mm. um, horses um, in the, sky horses <laughs> look, yeah, pulling the look, sun behind them. Yeah, in the, in the like sky. Pegasus, like Pegasus. Yeah, similar, yeah, like, yeah, that's an like, example. Yeah, with wings like over the sky. Mm. Yeah. So the horse is responsible for pulling the sun through the sky, you know, until mm. it goes dark again, and then the moon is is up. So you know, I quite like that idea, but maybe that's a bit of a romantic uh, 
mythical idea that I fancy there. Um, just gone to a few questions there. I think Joanne's on about the prize draw. If there's a prize draw, we'll go on a road trip. Hopefully, <laughs> camper van budget says, if we're lucky. Oh, uh, um, uh, Joanne talks about the white horse. She says it's mm. lucky that it wasn't destroyed in the war, still there for generations to come. Yeah. I've, yeah, I've no. seen, I've seen, I've also seen, is it true, that it's been on like a Big Brother ad? Um, it was used in... I haven't noticed that. <laughs> no, I, I can't remember that significantly, but I think I've seen it in a few commercial ads. It's quite well. iconic, so it wouldn't surprise me, yeah. Hmm. Um, Jonathan's mentioned a haunted camper van again. He's asking <laughs> also, though, is there anything like that over the UK, like the horse? Uh, well, that is in the UK. Yeah, um, yeah, this is. But is, is I suppose, I think that... Other, other, things, other ones, followed. maybe. Yeah. Is there um, anything? Is there's the yeah? There's lots. There's the of other chalk. So is the, the the other chalk is that's the man, isn't it? Like the new man. Yeah. Um. What's he called? Oh, I can't remember uh, his name. Um. Yeah. The, well, there's a few ones like mm. that. I've been to uh, Cern Abbas, I think right. Cern Abbas. Um. There's a man in the hillside there. I've been to see it a couple of times, but I can't um walk very close to it because it's really high up on the hillside, and I'm, I'm ac acrophobic, okay. so I can kind of just walk below and like see him from the other other hill because yeah. i get really terrified and have to come down um yeah the cern, cern abbas giant he's an interesting one, one um yeah. and he's he's stood there with i think he's holding um like a cudgel or something like, like that club, and he's quite yeah. proud in other ways which i won't yes. mention <laughs> family <laughs> audience <there>. so <laughs> um, Going back to the like the, the spirit, is there any kind of um, paranormal phenomena associated with the Uppington White Horse? Like, um, not necessarily like... paranormal phenomena, but there's definitely myths and legends. Um, quite quite nice ones, really. Um, so um, you have got yeah, I mentioned about Dragon Hill. So you've got mm. you've got that bit there with St George and the Dragon. Um, some there's a there's a myth myth that the the that the, the horse itself there is a mare mm. okay. and uh it said that on a hill not too far away there's a little foal carved in there but i, I don't think they found that or you know so does it exist i don't know but there's supposedly a little foal, foal in the hill nearby mm. and they'll come down at night together and they'll feed on the slopes mm. and they'll go off to a place nearby called woolstone wells and they'll have a drink and apparently the wells is in the shape of like a, a horse's hoof. So okay. I think that's where that kind of myth has come from. Yeah. Um, also. Uh, it's, it's so important, like the, the legends with horses are so important mm. there and, and, and traditions there. I see, I think it's somewhere, I don't know if it's still recognised that the horse was welcomed into a bar. There's some bar in England during Christmas time, I don't know if it's Christmas Eve, the bar, I think it's to do with the right of way, right of passage, mm. that the, the old walkways and then this pub is there, like, you know, that the horse is given free range in, in, in the oh, pub. Oh, wow. And, yeah. But, Different kind of kind of drink there. Then I guess the horse is taking. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I suppose that's that joke again. Why the long face? Because I'm a horse. Um. Um, there's, there's another couple of little legends which are also linked um, with Wayland Smithy with this with hmm. the horse. Um, so they say that um, the Uffington White Horse um, every hundred years um, comes alive and okay. comes out of you know comes out of its uh, chalk hill. And it trots down or gallops down to Wayland Smithy, right. where Wayland will um, change its shoes for him okay. or her. So um, there's that legend. So it's kind um, of all that's kind of connected yeah. as well. Like, yeah, it's kind of connected. And with Wayland as well, that particular place, you've got um, there's also a kind of uh, belief that if you take your horse there, so you know, it's not the Uffington horse, but it's still horse related, you take your horse there. And you leave a coin and the horse overnight at Wayland Smithy. The next day when you come back, your horse will be shod. So um, it's right. kind of like, yeah, a bit, bit of a horsey connection to, to Wayland as well. So, okay. yeah, not necessarily um, hauntings, but myths and legends, which are quite, quite nice. A bit of folklore. Okay. Would they accept anybody going up there and doing stuff like that? Is it kind of like a, a, a beacon for people to go up there and... Uh, do rituals and all that kind of stuff yeah well. i um definitely wayland smithy I, um i think with the horse um you can obviously go it's accessible i think it's national trust run um so you can park up 
you can walk up the hillside you can't obviously walk on the horse that's not mm. appropriate um but you can go quite close and see it um i don't see i've never seen anyone doing rituals there but wayland smithy i think um there's uh, people do sometimes do pagan rituals um and i think we went a couple of years back at halloween and mm. we were doing a bit of foraging along there and there was definitely um, some people doing a ritual there they were all like a, almost like a little festival there was like okay. a, a family and they were dancing and playing like uh penny whistle and various things so i think there is stuff and if you go inside wayland smithy because you can go in the long barrow you'll see incense right. and candles and yeah clearly people have been doing rituals and stuff in there so it is still kind of in use for that kind of thing okay uh, jonathan says sorry i have to go uh, see you next time stay safe i love to stay and listen to this on canny stories night bye night i <laughs> see you soon jonathan all the rest stay safe tonight hey gary how are you doing gary bro uh, hello you crazy peach i know how you doing gary hope you keep them well then staying safe for you for you and tracy as well and all the family there um i'll be hopefully you're not on the bike today or tomorrow because i don't know what the weather's like where you are there you go but i think i say it's bad anyway like ourselves there you know um but we've got to go to the like the competition so we're going to pick uh, a choice there of which colored gravestones the ghost girl has um walked out in front of so here she is and we're going to put her up there so you have a choice there i mean first of all you're um um ed bridget and possibly Liz. Now it's up to you, Ed. You could just shout it out there, <laughs> or you could just comment on the stage. Or if you're not there in a few minutes, so I have to ask Liz. Um, so, uh, what, which colour do you want to go for, Emma? Um, I think I'm going to go for the colour of Danny Robbins' uh, jacket, which will be red. Red for Emma. Red for Emma. Uh, uh, Ed, you go. You're going for purples, Ed. I think he said green to me, but he might want to type it. I'm only joking. <laughs> Purple. I think I heard him there. Either that or it's a ghost. <laughs> um, green. Just wait for yourself there, Bridget, there. And just wait for yourself, Bridget. And if you if you don't, we're going to have to ask Liz. So if you're there, Bridget, put down the colour that you think the ghost girl is going to walk out in front of. Oh. <laughs> Green was already taken, I think, wasn't it? I know you can pick as many colours. Uh, ah, green, okay. same green as well. She's so green. Hope, green. Uh, green. So two greens. Okay. So you have to stay until the end of the show to see uh, where the ghost girl, which colour gravestones does the ghost girl walk out in front of? Is uh, Liz there still? Liz, I, I, no, I suppose we're only supposed to pick two there. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, there. Like, Liz could have a go. Maybe if she's still there, I'll give you once, <laughs> I'll give you 10 seconds, Liz. 10, 9, <laughs> 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh, no, I think she's bored. No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I think she's God. on holiday, so she might have. Yeah, uh... she, she <laughs> oh, no. Oh, she oh, says blue. <laughs> <laughs> so I leave up to Emma. What do you reckon, Emma? Do I let her pick it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Since since it's she'll come after season. me if not. Okay. Blue, <laughs> so. Okay. God hope it's not orange, Amber. Um, Gary said red. You're not even. You should have been in early on, there, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Commented. Uh, he says, "Oh, great! I uh, see you at the bike fest, bro. I miss you sitting on bikes. That was not ours." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's me, like, you know, sitting on other people's bikes. <laughs> um, so the next topic we're going to talk about is the Whispering Mummies of St. Mm. Mikins. Now, I might pronounce it wrong. Is it St. Mikins or I, Mikins? I did or actually um, do Mikins? a little Google, because we discussed this before we came on. I think it is mm. Mikins. So okay. I'm going to go with Mikins. Okay. We might be uh, wrong. But... <laughs> so we've got a few photographs here as well there. So can you tell us uh, what's the background behind the church there um uh, emma um so um yes yeah, st Michael's is um quite an old church um in dublin um it's i think it's a church of ireland church now so anglican mm. um but it originally operated as a catholic church until the reformation apparently um it's on the north side of dublin on uh church street 
um so it wasn't too far i used to live in fibsborough so it wasn't too far from from where i used to live really I used to walk past it quite often when i walked to the city center um it was originally founded in um 1095 um as a kind of danish viking chapel so the original right. site of it um then the current structure you see in the picture there dates from the 17th century um because it was rebuilt in 1685 um, and I think in I think it might have been 1998. I read something about there being um, uh, some restoration on it. Right. And it's uh it's it's famous for its underground crypts. So it's got mummy mummified remains in there due to the dry limestone conditions. Mm. And um, it's also um, famous. Um, there's an organ in there which is um, very very old, apparently from 1700s. And it's claimed that Handel practiced um, for his first. Uh, performance of the messiah in there as well so it's got kind of quite a few historical links um inside that church but yeah there's the uh there's the creepy the creepy crypts that it's most famous for in that picture okay and and as as you're saying like uh we're going to talk about a few of the, the mummies that are mostly mm. recognized in the place there but uh is it the shears brothers who are they that are they seen as mummified uh, um bodies yeah, there yeah, I'm not. I don't know if they're necessarily mummified. They are in there. They're interred in there. Um, I'm mm. not 100 percent sure if they're actual mummies, um, but they were um, John and Henry. Uh, they were prominent figures in the Irish Rebellion of 1798, mm. um, and they were um, members of the Society of United Irishmen. So they were a revolutionary group seeking uh, to uh, get the Brits out. Mm. Um, they were sadly, I think they, from what I was reading, they were betrayed quite close to uh, when the rebellion was going to start, right. and they were arrested, tried for treason, and then they were hung, um, hanged, drawn, and quartered. So not very nice. Mm. And their remains are interred in the crypt there. Um, mm. Yes, and I think there's a copy of their um, execution warrant inside the crypt, or there was, I think. Yeah, you know, there's been a fire since, but um, there was a copy of the execution warrant down there as well that you could see as part of the tour. And like, as we got to, I suppose we go and talk on about mm. the mummies. Who are the like? As you can see, we've got a picture there. You yeah, able, are you able to identify which mummy it was when you were there? Probably not out of that because they all mm. kind of look similar, don't they? <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Yeah, the the mummies that you've got in those vaults um, in St. Michael's, um, they're believed to be the remains of wealthy Dubliners and notable figures, uh, mainly of the 17th and 19th centuries. Mm. And um, yeah, it's kind of a natural mummifications happened in there because of the atmospheric conditions of the vaults. Yeah. Um, and some of the kind of famous uh, mummies that they have in there, you've got one they call the Crusader. So I'm not sure. Mm which one that might be but he's he's uh six and a half feet foot tall mm. so he's a big chap and they've speculated that um he fought in the crusades so he's a crusader right. knight um his legs were broken and crossed over um maybe because he was yeah. so tall maybe yeah, they not... get him in the coffin i don't know but it's a bit gory mm. um and yeah he he was one of the ones that people could go and visit down there and um it's said that if you touch his finger, um, it brings you good luck. And people right. used to do that. I think it's it was you know since discouraged. Um, but I, me and my mum did touch his finger, but I don't know if it brought us good luck. <laughs> I've not won the lottery yet. So so there's one. Okay. Um, there's other bodies down there. There's um there's a mummified nun, okay. who's about four hundred years old, I believe. And there's one that they called the thief, and there's speculation um, that this person may have been a thief because um, its feet were cut off and its right forearm cut off, and they think it might have been due to a, being punished. But okay. um, you know, it's it's quite tenuous. They're not 100 percent sure of you know any of those people really. Yeah, you um, won't be too sure if it was well if it was high uh, have the wealthy. Why yeah, would he be down exactly. There? But exactly. Know. So yeah, nice, nice, nice stories, but probably not necessarily the, the real identities of those people. But that's how they were kind of identified, and yeah, you could go down and see them. Was it was there one the nun? Did you say that? Or yeah, there was supposed to be a four hundred year old nun in there, but I'm not sure which one it is out of those. Okay. 
and, 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 and say like as you mentioned because the, the, the grave i suppose it's kind of the, the natural elements mm. that are inside the vaults there that the, the lids would have come off eroded anyway would that be true well possibly I, I from what i read um it's got kind of limestone conditions down there um mm. so very dry air and also methane comes up from the ground this kind of methane comes up and these conditions kind of good for preserving mm. Not sure if that's kind of had the lids off. It might just be, you know, over time that things decay, yeah. don't they, and things break apart. It, suppose, things... Is, it, is it supposed to be about, because it is a bog land, I suppose, in the church. Was yeah, on, so that's, that's what... possible. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. probably where the methane aspect comes from. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, reasonably well-preserved mummies down there. I think also you've got the Earls of Leitrim in, de in decorated coffins in there as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few internments and, and stuff like that. And can you, can you uh, tell us about your experience there uh, with your mom there and tell us yeah. when it happened, when, when, when was it and that day you went down um, there? Yeah, so it was quite quite a while back. It was, I, it was when I was living in, in Dublin. It's probably about 14 years ago or something like that. And my mum was, um, she was, uh, she would definitely have been in the uncanny community because she really wanted to go and see these mummies for her birthday, you know, as you do. Nice birthday um, activity. <laughs> So we went down there on, on the tour, um, quite an informative tour as well. Um, yeah, so you enter the vaults and it's kind of cold, it's a cold and eerie atmosphere down there. Mm. Um, very dim lighting, um, narrow stone corridor that you enter and it kind of, the air feels quite heavy. Yeah, I think you can just see the, the entrance there. I don't know if you can see that near the... Okay. It's under towards the left, is it? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go down there, and there's, there's stone steps, and yeah, quite um, as I say, like quite uh, the air feels quite heavy, I guess, because mm. of the atmospheric conditions, and also because it's kind of very creepy feeling. Mm. Um, and then yeah, you you go in there, and you see the site of the some of the open coffins. Uh, you walk further along, you've got the mummified remains exposed there, so it can feel felt you know a little bit unsettling. Yes. And, and obviously, very, because it's a change yeah. in temperature, then it would be so yes. it's bodies because it's gone from yeah. possibly cold and it's kind of warmer down there. Yeah, and it's it's kind of very close quarters down there as well, which kind of makes it feel more kind of immersive and a little bit more macabre. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think you've got the open coffins, and I think going in that picture, they're going towards the end of the the uh, passage. You've got the the mummies there. Um, yeah so we went down and um the experience we had um so my mum went down to the end of the passage and there's kind of a slightly unexcavated bit there mm -hmm. you know bits of rubble and things like that and she was like peering in and uh she said to me that she heard voices all around her okay like whispering like murmuring and she said it was it felt quite oppressive to her i mean it did feel oppressive down there because of you know, the atmosphere, but she said it felt very oppressive. And she said she, it felt like there was a lot of people around her, like pressing very close to her. Right. And she, and she felt quite unsettled. She said she didn't feel frightened. And she couldn't feel a breeze or any wind or anything. And I think the 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 the, um, the door to the crypt was closed at that point as well. Mm -hmm. um, but she didn't feel frightened. She just felt, she just heard this kind of murmuring, whispering sounds. And she said to me, she said, can you hear that? Um, mm. no <laughs> i didn't hear anything but then i don't if i if you know there is such a thing i don't think i'm particularly uh sensitive or psychic in that way yeah, old, you know, yeah. yeah um i think she felt that she was a bit of a sensitive and she'd had quite a few experiences of different things but for me it, i it felt creepy down there but i didn't i didn't hear any whispering or anything like this so mm. yeah um and I think there's, I've read that there's other people that have had kind of similar experiences of, you know, whispering sounds or um, feeling that something's watching them or they've been, been touched by unseen hands and things. Mm. Um, so, yeah, quite, quite creepy. And um, like, I suppose, the, I suppose the most, I suppose the most explainable point of it is that I suppose the sound is, you, you're in a constricted area, sound is bound to vibrate more. Yeah. You don't know where, yeah. it's probably darkened, so you can't see other people around, so they might be whispering or talking. They might mm. be just outside the vaults talking, waiting to go in, and you think that's whispering there. And I suppose unseen hands put people pushing up against each other unknowingly. It could ex probably explain that. But 
what do you think personally um for me um i think probably you kind of touched on it there maybe infrasound um mm. because it's not too far from a road okay yeah. so um you can imagine underground you might get um very low level vibrations maybe mm. below human hearing which leave you feeling quite odd mm. um I believe that kind of thing can cause all kinds of different um, sensations, um, mm. feelings of fear and anxiety, chills, that kind of stuff. So maybe something like that has happened and she's kind of picked up on it. I didn't, though, but, you know, maybe she's more sensitive to that kind of thing. Or, you know, maybe it's the ghosts of those people who are interred. Who knows? It does, that's the other <laughs> point. We just don't know. Like, you know, we just don't know. i um, just got a few shout outs and we'll continue talking about it there. Gary says, head into the Hellfire Club soon. Good for you there, Gary. Mm. Hopefully, I think that's the Dublin Hellfire Club. There. Ah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've been up there. The yeah, Hellfire Club there. Uh, well, stay safe. And I don't know. If, I remember Gary going to it. I think it was a few years ago, and was, I think it was close to bonfire night. There was fireworks going all wow. over the place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I don't know. But it was another kind of a uh, kind of abandoned kind of location, mm. uh, moving building or something like that. And Gary, I think Sam as well. Was, I, forget, I think it was Sam or Warren that was with them. It's a good spot. There. I've I've been on a tour up there one time and it is, yeah, proper, proper creepy. And Gary says, me and my tech guy could come on your show and talk about uh, our experiences. Apparently one of the most haunted locations on the planet there. If, that is, if it's Sam, yeah, do or, or get in contact there. We're now we're coming to the end or maybe next year, next uh, season there. Um, Adam says, worth, worth mm. noting, unfortunately, due to extensive fire and subsequent water damage earlier this year, St. Michael's is closed until further notice very possible possible for uh, for good. Yeah, we're going to just talk about that now then, Adam, going mm. on to that there, you know. Um, so, yes, um, uh, apparently five mummies, including the Crusader, were destroyed in a fire in, of june this year mm. um do you do you reckon personally yourself we've got adam's opinion there do you reckon it will be opened up again i'm i'm not sure i mean it's it's a place that's been frequently kind of vandalized as well mm. isn't it i think i was reading in 1996 it was damaged by vandals mm. uh, i think 2019 i think someone broke in and stole the head of a couple of the mummies including that crusader um they recovered it and the person was jailed um, but now, once again, you've got someone's broken in, haven't you, and set fire to the place. And, yeah, there's been extensive damage from what I could see. I, the Crusader is gone. He's one of the ones that was, was burned yes, um, and some yeah. of the others. Um, I know they've arrested and charged someone. But, um, yeah, there's definite concerns around um, the damage caused um, and how to preserve the site and also security of the site. Um, mm. So, you know, it's... St. Michael's is of great historical importance in Dublin, really, and cultural site. So I'd like there to be efforts to save it and preserve it and still have tours. Mm. Um, but whether that will be possible is, you know, depends on the amount of damage, doesn't it, and what they can do and, and also money available to, to fix it up and stuff. But, you know, I think uh, the tours and things that ran um, helped keep the church going and stuff so it might be that they need to do that to maintain that church um, yeah. so i guess we'll have to watch watch and see won't we well they said it's five mummies been destroyed so hopefully yeah, there's, there's more, that was but, one of them yeah but the yeah, famous so, one the the crusader yeah. he was one of them he was mm, the draw wasn't he is that with the lucky finger yes yeah it's, it's, it's a shame there and like is, so is there anything like this in england as well is there any places where you can go it's similar that have, um have, or around britain there that have similar kind of churches with vaults you can visit oh I, i'm not sure if there's ones with mummies in there there may well be if there are i'm going to be at them mm. so uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> i mean the, there are churches with vaults in that you can visit i mean there's one just mm. down the hill which i've done i've been on a paranormal investigation a kind of public one i'm not in the team or anything at the moment so don't kind of really do a lot of that anymore but i went on a, a public one with uh dr kate cheryl and karen Bessant from jamaica Inn at okay. the mount without in bristol just down the road from me and um you go you can go in the vaults there because um, that's a bar now <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, right. cool. but that's where we were doing our table tipping and uh, <laughs> all that kind of stuff the bar well i say the bar was closed it was open for a few drinks but uh um yeah you, they had ouija boards and all kinds of stuff in there and also in the main church so yeah i'm, I'm certain there probably are ones out in britain that you can go to i may have to research and uh, see if i can find some with mummies 
Mm. I know it's I know it's it's it's, it's interesting like because I like and I know there's a theatre around Dublin called Small Galley that did have coffins there, but the yeah. bodies have been interred somewhere else. But they got these stone big stone coffins, like you know, and they got the crucifix on the lid there. And they, they won't want to lift them anyway. <laughs> they're not going to go anywhere. Like, but they're underneath the theatre of Small Galley mm. in Dublin and Temple Bar around that area there. Um, but um, what, like investigations wise, do you reckon like St Michael's would have been a great place for investigators to go or? You see, I, I have mixed feelings about whether there would be anything haunting a cemetery or graveyard or crypt. Um, my feeling is that you get hauntings, you know, where something terrible has happened or where someone lived and loved a place. Mm. I, I don't know why people, someone would haunt, you know, or spirit would remain where they're buried. Mm. I mean, it might be a thing. Um, I don't know. Um, but I just, you know, I, when I get scattered or buried, I don't think I want to hang around that area. I'd go somewhere I liked, you know. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> depends on how, Yeah, it depends on it's how you feel about it. Hmm. Well, you hear like in, in like American Native Americans being, you know, yeah. the house has been built on their uh, uh, resting place there, you know. And how activity is supposed to be escalated in those parts mm. of the world as well, you know. Uh, Gary says, shared onto this page as well. Thank you for that, Gary. Cheers for that, bro. And um, yeah, if you have, if those who are watching there, if you have any personal stories about St. Michael's there, feel free to put them forward there. Um, so uh, how how amazing is <laughs> Ashton says how amazing is Emma doing a live chat knowledgeable and very uh, articulate? Uh, no, she's amazing. I'll send you that tenor later, Ashling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as, as you said, you've done so. You've done a paranormal investigating yourself. There, have you? Yeah. Have you, do you still do it, or do you draw? No, I I did that um, when I was in um, living in Dublin. Um, it was with a team called. Um, bumps in the night which um adam there unexplained ie was a member of at that, that time <laughs> yeah <laughs> at that time um yeah we kind of did it for a year or so maybe a bit longer um had to wind it up for for various reasons um we did a few places we did ross castle uh i think Chol cholville castle um a few other kind of sites i would have loved to have gone to lep mm. i think places like that um but yeah, we, we did that. I did that for a bit. Then when I came over here, um, didn't really kind of find any other team or anything. I did have a little look initially. Um, mm. So I don't really do that anymore. But I do like to write about stuff. And I kind of feel yeah. quite comfortable um, doing that because I'm not having to creep around places at 2 a.m. You know, on a work night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just creep around my computer at 2 a.m. on a work night doing some <laughs> yeah. writing. Yeah. But it is it's fine when you as long as you get the work of you know it's an art itself writing about yeah. the paranormal it, yeah. itself there you know and, yeah. and and like yourself you said were your partner Ed 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 is involved in it as well is, is he... yeah um he's I mean when we first met he came on a couple of investigations with me in in, in Dublin I think he was at um, Ross Castle I think he did one there with us um, and yeah he tends to come to the stuff I do here I mean I have been on some some um, ones with other kind of like you know public ones um i've done um the scary din i think i think the the ram in the ancient ram in okay which ed came along to um so he's interested in all this and he yeah he's my 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 uh my wingman and proofreader uh mixologist of the cocktails uh yeah, <laughs> my driver <laughs> But it's it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's amazing you can hit off each other as well. Like my wife Jennifer, she's part of the same team as as ourselves in Ghost Era there, and uh, she it's great to hit off those people and experience that similar thing there as well. But if if you are an individual, if you are watching, and you're an individual as well. Like it's great people to hit our friends or other people to talk to them as well. It's great to have that kind of people that you can go to in that kind of way. Yeah. Ed, Ed says, who's Ed? Sorry, I'm just talking about this. Apparently there's a mummy at the church <laughs> in London. Ooh, where's that? Uh, uh, church in Gar London. Garlic. <laughs> mm, St. James Garlic something? Yeah, ga 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 Garlic. Garlic. <laughs> 
that place. <laughs> uh, have you ever been Ooh. to the vaults in Edinburgh? Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's either last year or the year before um, we went high. down into the vaults. Um, it's an interesting place. Um, it did feel creepy, um, but didn't really experience anything. You know, it was, on, it was on one of the tours that you can go on, which was was quite interesting. Um, mm. But one of the rooms was supposed to be haunted with like one of the, the vaults was supposed to be haunted by um, some children. Yeah. They had all these creepy dolls in there and stuff. And I stayed in there a little bit on my own. But yeah, the only thing so that creeped it, me out was the dolls, really. <laughs> it's, it's probably quite similar to St. Mike's there as well. Yeah. Uh, if you talk about Midri Street vaults. You got the claustrophobia coming in from a cold, probably yeah, really cold, mm. and it's kind of warmer down there. And and you got the green emergency lighting, so you can see things and shadows and all that. You know, it's that amount, my right amount of lighting, lighting to see those kind of uh, uh, shadow figures as well. You know, um, yeah. I suppose as well. I suppose there's interesting things. I suppose going back to Dublin as well, like there is an underground kind of area as well i think it's a custom house there but it's oh, yeah. a Dublin castle but it's not quite it's not open i don't think to the public to see mm. and um i know with foley street which is the old um there was used to be the old red light district of dublin oh, yeah. and europe the biggest in europe that there used to be passages underneath dublin where people could go and you know have fun time to business, you know, yeah. make business <laughs> and it's, it's red light district you know and i think one famous monarch visited there and lost his virginity apparently there around the area uh, it's not king it's not king charles he's probably a member but a good few uh yeah uh, <laughs> centuries back yeah uh, but he says that castle is a very good mm. one to go back there as, as you said you mentioned that castle there yeah i'd like i'd like to go there i think i think um when i joined bumps in the night um the team had before I joined they'd not long done that and I was hoping that we'd go again but yeah we didn't and I missed out yeah. but I hear it's quite quite an interesting place and and I suppose the final question about I suppose we're talking about the uh vaults again there um as you're saying like it's it's is it was it do you reckon I was kind of controversial question do you reckon it was a statement by somebody that the reason why it was burnt down now this is a controversial question now I'm controversial sometimes uh, was it was there a reason do you reckon I haven't read there being a reason I doubt there is I just mm. think uh people c could find ways to get in there and vandalize it as I mentioned mm. there's a couple of other times it's been vandalized in the past mm. so I think just someone decided they're going to do that people and when you, when, you personally went, when you personally went down there with there with your mother was it busy that day as well when you know was it, was it a big hot spot um i think there was about seven or eight people on the tour with us um mm. so yeah it was relatively busy but I, I don't there wasn't like lots of people walking around the the graveyard there or in the church or anything it was relatively quiet i mean that might be one of the reasons that it's generally quite quiet so mm. people have time to go in there and try and get into the vault and cause mischief mm. um yeah i'm so, pretty, I suppose that, yeah I suppose that kind of explain again the paranormal phenomenon it's very quiet there as well yeah. you know, so the whispering yeah. noises can be heard it's um, not too far from from a road though there's oh. um there's a main a biggish road in front of it so that's mm. why i wonder about the, the infrasound and things like that mm. and um i suppose i suppose that's uh, all the questions there so i'm going to probably go to uh the the, the uh the halloween uh competition well halloween mega draw competition hopefully this works now and um we're going to the colors which the ghost girl goes in front of one of the colors is it amber orange which is at the top left blue top right the green the bottom left or red at the bottom right which one was it uh ed you picked um purple no i'm only joking <laughs> green. uh green along with bridget picked green liz you picked blue hopefully good luck to you all and emma you picked red yeah, so yeah. let's see which that was a bit of a late laugh ed <laughs> Ten second delay, said. Ten second delay you <laughs> said here we go fingers crossed Ooh. 
And there we go. We've got a winner. Mm. And luckily, and it's thanks to you, Emma, Liz. Yeah. Liz, has got excellent. In there. So Liz has got <laughs> in the Halloween mega draw, which is coming up on, there's two types of draws. There's not many people in it, so you've got a great chance of winning. I think you're going to be, there's only five of you in it. And there's two uh, collections of prizes you can win, Ooh. which is amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, so Work got, list. Was it two out of five chances? Of, one out of five. I don't know. I forget my, my fractions and all that. <laughs> well, you got a good chance there, Liz. Um, so uh, she says, "Good luck." Uh, well, she says, "Yes." And, and uh, Jenny, how are you doing, Jenny? From my mobile panel. How are you doing, Jenny? Um, uh, Ed says, "Good, good work, Liz. Well done there." Um, so. Emma, can you tell us what have you got planned up in the future and uh, what, what you're working on at the moment? Well, um, I think just building on the writing, um, I kind of, um, although I've had my blog quite quite a few years, it was dormant for quite a long time. And I only kind of really um, started writing again um, after I met the people in the Uncanny community. Um, so that was about a year or so ago. And um, yeah, I've been writing um, a bit more it's been getting a bit more popular um, I've started writing for Haunted magazine and uh, very kindly there Adam and explained um, IE um, has asked me to do some guest posts which I could plan on continue doing so yeah I've got a few more um, trying to get at least one uh, blog post out a month um, something for Adam at least a month if I can um, and um, trying my best to get in an, um, Haunted Magazine um, each, each edition. So um, I'll try and keep those things going. And I'm thinking about, it's still in the early stages, um, thinking about doing a podcast next year. Um, right. So I think one of the things I've got to get my head around is how to do the recording because I'm in a, a flat and it's very, you've got people above, people below, <laughs> cars outside, student area, they're partying at night. <laughs> so it's, um yeah, how to, to do the recordings and stuff like that. So I've got lots of ideas for it, but it's, yeah, it's how to do a good sound recording. So um, mm. yeah, but thinking about that for next year, that'll be my uh, um, kind of project for 2025 i think so fingers crossed i get that done yeah, sorted. So there's always technical troubles and i've yeah. had it this year with this as well like you know so there's always trouble i better not say anything in the book now because i might get taken off <laughs> like, <laughs> you know and um i'm just going to talk about what's coming up in the future so we've got at a halloween extravaganza for people this is where yourself liz and other people like snow from the occult family Derek Whelan uh, from Ghost Era, our team. This is not not uh, it's not just fake trickery that we're doing. <laughs> Stephen Young, uh, who we, I interviewed earlier on in the season, and also somebody called Adam from Unexplained.ie. He never heard of him. Into the draw, never heard of him. No. You're also in the draw as well. So there's five of you in the draw to win a, a collection of prizes each. But also as well, Wednesday the thirtieth at nine p.m. Folks. There will be also a little money giveaway, so stay tuned for that during that show. If you if you didn't have a get a chance there, you have the fabulous chance of winning three thousand cent. No, yeah, three thousand cent. Okay, <laughs> which is thirty euro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds, I think that's right. But I hope it's not even more. Right, you know, we have a chance for that. But also on a Halloween extravaganza, it's going to be a five-hour broadcast with informative chat. And special guests and prizes will be won, but we'll also ha have the opportunity to watch the premiere of Old World Order, which is a, a, a documentary about an investigation Pucker Paranormal did alongside Paragirls that are. And you'll be able to see that uh, next Wednesday evening. Guests include next week, uh, next week include Gavin Canavan, a demonologist. We also, also got uh, Amanda and Irene from Spooky Japan podcast. Mm. Also, uh, um, I think it's Tim. Tim from uh, Skia, uh, uh, I think from he does the paranormal stuff. So equipment. So we showcasing the bits of uh, equipment there. Also, Lisa from Power Girls with another team member. Uh, we also have Mary and I think I think it, uh, and Shane from um, also from the Netherlands as well from the Ravens Paranormal. They'll be also on the show, yeah. and so that that be for next week. There, folks. There, um, uh, Ashlyn says I tried voice recording and ended up with the cats purring and meowing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's to do with podcasts there or podcasts there, you know. 
yeah, <laughs> you got a love cat there, you know. Um, so yes, folks, um, uh, thank you there, Emma, and thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. Um, it was great to meet you a couple of weeks ago at the yeah. convention there. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to see you again. I don't know. If you, I don't know yeah. If yeah, he's got one next year, but I don't know if I'll be over. I see him, we'll see anyway, yeah. but hopefully we'll cross uh, the uh, routes again there. Um, so that's it, folks, there. Um, brilliant talk, Emma. Um, <laughs> you would do a brilliant podcast. Yes, you would. <laughs> um, all I've got to say there, folks, is stay safe tonight as well and tomorrow there. If you're out paranormal investigating, make sure you uh, travel safe and keep warm and dry there. Uh, Emma, anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, it's it lovely um, talking to you. And this has been my kind of first ever one of these things. So um, I was very nervous before, but I've I've enjoyed it. So, yeah, you've been put at ease and uh, lovely questions from people and everything. So, yeah, it's good fun. Yeah, so catch um, Emma on, on Ghost Catcher Isles, which is that's, uh, that's on Facebook, is it, and Instagram? <laughs> Um, it is, and the blog itself is ghostcatcherisles.com. So, um, yeah, you can have a little look at my blog if you like. There's posts on there about um, St. Mychen's and my mum's experience down there. Um, there's also one about the Uffington horse. Um, nothing particularly about Uncanny, but um, I'm going to Uncanny Con later this year. So, you know, I might write a little something about that. Okay. Um, but yeah, do you have a little look? And um, also there as well, you got written in the Haunted recent edition of haunted magazine yeah it? um i my first my debut one was in issue 42 which was about the east somerton witch and i can't i sometimes get them mixed up but there's uh, i think it's the west somerton giant it's probably vice versa or something right. um but that was um that's that was uh, a bit of an exploration in norfolk of uh, a real life giant and um a folkloric witch so there's um some one of my first articles in there and I th the current e edition 43 I've um, gone over to Japan with my writing um because okay. I have an interest in Japan and I did live there for a bit um and I've written about um female Japanese vengeance ghosts so oh, they are yeah. ladies you do not want to mess with and that's yeah. in issue 43 yeah I think there's some close similarity to the was it the ring something to do with that yeah so yeah that, inspired yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so also want to explain that I use well there. Yes. yes. Um, so, folks, uh, I won't see you next time. I'll see you in the near distance. Bye bye for now. Hope you have a great evening, great weekend. Stay bye. safe, folks. Slager fall. Anish. Bye bye. I must stop. I must press the stop button. Sure I press <laughs> it, yeah? I'll press the stop. Wait there. Wait, the mouse is going over here. Wait there. Bye bye bye. <laughs>